So you want to write memory with eBPF. Um, hopefully, that's why you're here. Uh, or at least you want to hear about how we tried to do it. Uh, my name is Mike Dame. Uh, up until recently, I was a software engineer at Google. I'm now at Odegos. And my name is Nikol Groshevsky. I'm a software engineer with Grafana Labs. And we're both maintainers of an open source project that's using eBPF to uh, write to user space from the kernel. And we'll get into a little bit more details about that. But um, just to kind of go over what we're going to show in this talk, um, the goal is to kind of show our, journey, our use case and then our, our journey with trying to solve that use case within eBPF of uh, why are we writing to user space memory, uh, the sort of problems that we ran into with like the current options that are available, um, go through the alternatives that we've looked at at different layers of the application, and then kind of wrap it all up and think about like what does this mean for eBPF, what does it mean for us going forward, um, and all that. So. Um, why write user space memory with eBPF? The thing is that a lot of traditional or like classical eBPF programs don't really need to do this. They don't need to write into user space for most of like security, networking, or even observability use cases. You can get most of what you want done uh, either before or after the request has hit the user space. Um, if you think about security, that just kind of broadly speaking falls into like allowing and denying or rerouting. Um, networking, you can obviously rewrite packets, uh, you know, write a load balancer, the eBPF supports that great. And even a lot of observability signals, if you're talking about like uh, metrics or profiles, can kind of be done read only. Um, you don't really need to uh, write into the uh, application itself, uh, except for one signal, and that is uh, distributed tracing, which is our project, and that fundamentally uh, requires you to write into the signal, which makes it kind of unique for it to be functional. So uh, Nicola, talk a little bit about uh, what makes tracing unique. Yeah, so if you see this picture here, essentially what we want to find is actually track a request going through one service, then going through another service, and eventually making it somewhere else, so we can produce distributed tracing. Uh, this is typical how distributed tracing works. Open telemetry has many SDKs, auto instrumentation, manual instrumentation, that do this approach one way or another. So what does this distributed tracing actually do? Um, so you can go to the next slide. How it works is that uh, we use this W3C standard for uh, trace ID, which consists of a couple of parts. Uh, one is the main part, trace ID, which is common across all the different parts of this request making it through the system. And then we have a span ID, which is used to create this parent-child relationship, what came before what, so we can find the distributed, actually, aspect of traces all tie up together. This is later then typically displayed in some sort of database that does tracing, and it can be visualized and explored by end users. So. Yeah, so in practice, what does this look like? And we're talking about doing it in Go because the real challenge here is, um, you know, Go is kind of a, uh, other languages sort of have this problem that we'll talk about handled, but Go is, you know, being statically compiled uh, creates its own challenges. But in general, if you're going to write this into a Go application, um, the pseudocode looks like you have a, a request handler that parses a trace parent header out of your request, um, reads the, the span context from that. You make a, a function call to start a new span context. And then whenever you make a, a new request from that, or if you're making your response, um, you have to update the headers with the new ID. Um, and so in, on here, this looks pretty simple, but if you're familiar with open telemetry at all, you know that there's a lot more involved in just that. And if you're not familiar with open telemetry, I definitely recommend checking it out um, to at least understand the pain that we're talking about. Um, so what we want to do is do this more automatically um, with eBPF. Um, like I mentioned, Go is statically compiled, so you're, there's no dynamic runtime that you can hook into and inject these function calls. Um, but we do have known sets of function calls for like the net HTTP libraries, um, gRPC libraries, where we could, in theory, and we do, um, read these functions and just handle that like boilerplate um, span context propagation, uh, generating the new span contexts. Uh, so this is what you know where we would where we do insert those sort of function calls uh, in the kernel. 
And so what you end up getting out of it is uh, you know, a trace that looks like this. And this, uh, if you're familiar with tracing, doesn't look too special. But this is actually something that we got without writing any uh, instrumentation code in our application at all. You can see that we're actually, um, you know, through multiple services, able to track a specific single request. This isn't just like black box tracing or like a service map or anything. This is a real um, you know, propagated context throughout uh, one single uh, request. Um, and so the project that we're doing that with is this uh, the, op the upstream open telemetry uh, Go instrumentation project, which is uh, kind of the um, the main library kernel uh, you know framework to uh, do this. Um, both Odegos and Bela from Grafana. Grafana fork off of this uh, to you know add more functionality and. Um, just to kind of mention, this isn't like a totally uh, a, you know novel approach. It's got some interest, uh, you know, enough to raise an eyebrow. People are pretty interested in trying to do this, um, but the the uh, ability to write that memory with eBPF is uh, itself a pretty novel use case of eBPF. Um, so that's where we started to um, ask about our approach a little bit. So how do we do it? We use this. Um, helper, BPF Probe Write User, uh, which exists in the BPF um, libraries to be able to write to any arbitrary user space memory, uh, which has its own um, you know, gotchas. Uh, it isn't, doesn't have a great level of support from the maintainers because uh, it has uh, the potential to you know, write out of memory. Um, you, know, you can crash your system if you're not careful with it. And what we found is that there aren't actually a lot of other, uh, really any other legitimate use cases of this helper. We think that we might be maybe the first one um, trying to look through just public use cases on GitHub. A lot of them are making like rootkits or hacks with it. Um, so trying to actually use it for good um, observability is uh, pretty new uh, in this space. Um, but Unfortunately, because of the lack of real use cases for it, it's been um, additionally locked down within the kernel where it's uh, you know, in a secure boot mode. It uh, isn't even going to be available by default. Um, so looking at all of this, we started to kind of scratch our heads and say, OK, if this isn't like, maybe this isn't the best option that is available. I mean, maybe it's not just the only one. What else has been proposed and what have people looked at and um, what other options are available for us to achieve this in process context propagation? Um, so this was an interesting proposal by someone from Google um, who they, they said that they need a use case for this. Um, what we know is that they're working on some high performance scheduler where they need a fast way to communicate between the kernel and user space applications. So they use this helper. Uh, but because it's protected, uh, they, um, they asked to introduce a new helper, which is BPF Probe Write User Registered, uh, where the applications kind of register memory regions which are safe to write to. So it's not the full virtual outer space of the process, but it's something that is carefully considered by the applications themselves. Now, unfortunately, that particular uh, request was not actually accepted by the kernel. Uh, to be added as a new API or modify the previous API. And um, a suggested better fit was maybe use a BPF Arena, which is a very new feature added since kernel 6.9, I believe, uh, that exists as an option for BPF developers to use. So we explored BPF Arena. We said, OK, well, that BPF Pro write user register would have worked for us, but maybe we can use BPF Arena. So what BPF Arena is, it's like a BPF map, the ones that we maybe know and use already, but it's a flat, just heap region with no structure that the user space and the kernel can share and write any way they like. So it sounds like a pretty good use case, right? I mean, it is a memory region. It's not formatted in any way and whatnot. But <clears throat> the difference here is that in our case, if you look at a picture here, is like, how are we going to use uh, this BPF Arena for a Go program. So the memory is shared by the BPF user space and the BPF kernel space. But what about the user space application we want to monitor? How do we make that use of the arena? Potentially, you could say, well, maybe we can make our 
program the BPF user space program, somehow magically make it use this. But at the same time, that elevates the permission, because BPF does need elevated permissions to some extent. So it's not actually a good choice for any like HTTP service running on the web being also a BPF user space program. Could potentially be compromised. Now, at the same time, the BPF maps are zeroed out by default. So you can't just put the whole of Go heap where you want to write, because as soon as you map your Go heap to the BPF arena, it gets whacked with zeros, so your program crashes. Therefore, not the use case we, we have in this case can be replaced with uh, BPF arena, we think. Yeah, so at this point, we started to kind of feel like we were hitting a roadblock and trying to find a better alternative to BPF ProBright user. I mean, we looked at, you know, there is the option that's available now. It doesn't have great support. And we looked at other use cases that had been publicly proposed. Um, and then we even started to think about what if we allocate the entire Go heap as a memory space. Um, so we start to think, well, is this even really a memory problem. So let's take another step back. And like, you know, trace context is fundamentally a network issue. They're propagated by headers on the request. So um, eBPF really supports networking stuff. So uh, maybe there's something there that we can use. And so we started to look in some uh, use cases with that. Yeah, so we mentioned in previous slides the BPF uh, probe SKB write buffer, which is a normal way that at the networking layer, either XDP or traffic control, uh, you can write memory there for packets, so TCP packets, UDP packets, and so on. So we said, well, maybe we can actually do level four context propagation, and we've prototyped this. So what this means is that, well, we could potentially encapsulate the trace context within TCP IP options, places that nobody ever looks at. They're not part of the typical application stack. They're at the networking level of the OS. As long as they make it through to the other side and you have the agent running on all sides, then you can extract the context when, you, when the packet arrives, providing it to the other side, allowing the tracing to work. So it's kind of a cool idea, but it has some drawbacks. Well, one thing is that uh, these TCP packets, uh, they have to be, you know, like, read and written by the same program, otherwise it doesn't work, which means there's no interoperability between us and the Open Telemetry SDKs, which sort of defeats the purpose. Like, we're Open Telemetry, but yeah, we can give the data to another Open Telemetry instrument application. And obviously, any level seven proxies, which replay packets, discard the original packets, start a new one, like load balancer or something like that, it will not work unless those are instrumented as well with the same sort of approach. So not an ideal solution. So then we looked at something else. Um, so we said, well, if we kind of have this limitation about level four context propagation because we have all these requirements, can we actually inject this uh, trace context information using at level seven, so HTTP? Maybe we can add this header ourselves. So uh, initial prototype for this actually worked fully at uh, the traffic control level with Linux traffic control. And, but that was actually pretty nasty because we had to make sure that the sequence numbers and the ACK numbers are properly adjusted across uh, the path. Like when we actually cheat about the sequence number, we have to cheat it back and reverse it and so on, which wasn't ideal. It worked, however, restarting the profiling, the monitoring agent here would have actually break existing connections, which is not an ideal solution. But then we discovered that we can actually have a different program type, which is this SK message that is used for monitoring sockets, where we can actually push the data. There's an API that was contributed by Cloudflare, I believe, that can actually space the packet before it reaches the TCP stack. And then we use traffic control to write. This actually works well, except it, uh, with encryption, it doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, we have to see this data unencrypted to know where to add our trace parent sort of trace context, right? Which was not the case where we had the ability to write memory at goal level because we write the memory before even the, T the SSL or TLS layer in the goal libraries takes over. So at higher level, it was a bit easier to work around these problems. Yeah, and so on that note, we thought, you know, 
moving even further away from the network level, um, if we wrote some sort of like sidecar agent that could you know, act as almost a gateway router um, for all the requests that are going in and out of a pod, then we could handle the, uh, the headers at the user space level without having to worry about encryption. Um, but obviously, this adds its own levels of complexity. Um, you'd have to make the networking updates to make sure that all your requests are passing through this gateway agent. And it also adds more hops per um, request that go through it. So uh, yeah, we've gone further and further away from the uh, you know, original question of using eBPF to write memory to the point where now we're even asking ourselves, it, do we need to use eBPF for this at all? Um, you know, we are we trying to just force eBPF too hard for this? It would be really nice. It makes the most sense because of Go residing on the kernel or on the host. Um, so, what other options do we have besides using eBPF to do this? I'm just trying to cover all of our bases. Yeah, so maybe we thought eBPF is cool. This is why we will implement this. So we thought, well, maybe we use the standard approach how people used to do this in the past, use uh, library interpositioning on Linux where you can kind of hijack existing calls um, if they're in a shared library. So preload your version that, as an example here, we have SSL write or SSL read uh, that you can kind of just change to be doing your own logic rather than anything else. And if the application actually doesn't use a shared library but is statically linked, then you have to use some sort of level of patching, uh, change the code, uh, stop the application, and so on, which is you know how other things work. And um, yeah, this does work to some extent. However, it doesn't have all of the benefits that we get with eBPF, which is why we chose in the first place. Um, we have to use all this logic and write all this stuff. At the same time, cleanup is not actually a nearly as easy as you know, shutting down uProbe and have the, uh, the kernel support just simply whack them for you and unload everything. It's kind of nice. It doesn't destabilize anything. And um, you know, statically linked code is difficult to patch. Fortunately, there is this library, Frida Core, that everybody likes using, um, and it's pretty cool. But having said that, it's not as nearly as easy as actually have an eBPF uh, do this for us. Um, so then we found this other project. It's called BPF Time. Um, and it's actually a user space implementation of the, of the eBPF uh, parts of the eBPF that can be in user space. For example, your probes are done in user space. Some trace points, I believe. Um, obviously, no, none of the kernel stuff, like K-probes and so on. And this actually works well if people are willing to accept that this is not going to run the usual uh, BPF runtime that everyone loves and uses. Uh, you can still run through the verifier and so on, but we have to understand that this is actually a very different runtime at all, uh, which comes with its own set of problems. Are people willing to run that? You know, um, and it's great for testing, though, um, having something that's easy to uh, kind of manipulate in user space. Uh, this is kind of where it all came for full circle for us because we started with a pretty simple problem that seemed like eBPF could solve, um, just updating these headers in the user space before they go out on a request. And then we looked at doing it further at the network level to fit within eBPF. And then we looked at not even using eBPF and just trying to patch those libraries in. Ultimately, coming back to using a user space uh, re-implementation of eBPF that we've gone so far from the original eBPF that we're still <laughs> using it. Um, so uh, that kind of left us thinking, like, you know, just reanalyzing re this whole problem, saying, like, so we want to write memory with eBPF. Um, it, it's possible. You can do it. Uh, but the problems are that the current best options in eBPF lack a lot of strong upstream support. Using this probe write user helper isn't really uh, you know, supported and uh, encouraged. Um, but all the alternatives that are available, and we think we've gone through a lot of them, yeah. have their own trade-offs, both in security and just the general user experience. You know, the further you get from that like, native eBPF experience, um, the more you lose like, the benefits of eBPF. That kernel portability, it's uh, you know, available by default everywhere. Um, the verifier, making sure that your program is safe. Um, and so it, it's really, you know, I, I put this um, Captain America meme up there because it's, you know, so you want to write memory with eBPF. But he also says in this scene that I noticed, the only way to 
really be cool with this is to follow the rules, which, you know, if what we're talking about was um, really supported and available in the kernel, it would be much cooler to do. Um, so that's kind of where we sit. We went through all these alternatives, and we have a couple plausible options. Uh, we don't have a strong answer for it, but kind of looking ahead for what this means for us and just for eBPF in general, we're wondering if there are more valid use cases for being able to write to user space memory in eBPF, and we think so, um, at least because we think our use case is valid. Uh, but up until this point, there hasn't been a lot of vocal, um, you know, solid use cases for it. Uh, but potentially, could there be some days eBPF grows? And if there are, how would this be addressed in a way that is, you know, strong, supportable, reliable? Um, you know, it seems like something where you're coordinating between uh, the eBPF program and the user space program is kind of a theme that has come up um, with the BPF probe, right, or the registered right user call, yeah. um, the BPF arena, both kind of defining safe areas to do it. Could be something like that. In general, the question that we have that's leaving us like scratching our heads is how can we build stronger native support for this into the kernel um, and the community itself? So. Um, Kind of want to wrap up with those questions for you. Um, yeah, that's that's really all we had to uh, talk about. This is our journey with this. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to join us on any of these Slack channels. Or I think we probably have a couple minutes to take some questions now too. But uh, thank you. Any.